We're now ready to talk about Lagrange multipliers. In Calculus 1, we took a look at finding maxima and minima, and we've now applied that into multivariable calculus. We can find the maximum and the minimum values on a surface or a function of three or more variables using the techniques that we learned in section 4.7. We can also find absolute extrema on closed and bounded regions within the domain. The next thing that we want to take a look at is probably the next thing that came up in Calculus 1, which is how to apply this situation of finding maximum and minimum values on a function to real world problems. Now, when we're thinking about real world problems, we are thinking about optimization problems. In other words, we have some value that we're trying to optimize. For example, perhaps we're trying to optimize volume of a particular shape, but it's subject to certain constraints. For example, if you're dealing with a box, then your X value, Y value, and Z value need to be strictly positive, or you don't, in fact, have a box. That's a constraint on the volume of the box and a constraint on the value of that function. There could be other constraints that come in. For example, if you're trying to optimize velocity, you know that time can't be negative. That's a constraint. Or perhaps you're trying to maximize volume and minimize surface area, but the materials used for each side are different. And so you have constraints with the cost of the materials. Whenever we have this type of problem, we have what's called the objective function, which is the thing we're trying to optimize, velocity or the volume or something like that. And then we have constraints on that equation because we could have the equation in pure mathematics with no real world meaning. And there wouldn't be any restrictions on the variables other than what's imposed by the function itself. But in a real world situation, dimensions have to be, well, non-negative. And if you want an actual box, they have to be strictly positive. Time can't be negative. So when you're thinking about a real world situation, these additional requirements on the equation are called constraints or constraint equations. We want to take what we learned in section 4.7 and now use it to solve optimization problems in multivariable calculus. Now, as you might expect, this is going to cause, well, some difficulty because we're in multivariable calculus, so we have multiple variables. And now we've added more equations with these constraint equations. The Lagrange multiplier method is one of the most common and useful ways to solve this type of problem. Let's take a look at our learning objectives. Our learning objectives for this section are relatively straightforward. Use the method of Lagrange multipliers to solve optimization problems with one constraint, and then use the method to solve problems with two constraints. You'll notice that we're not including a lot of constraints here because the more constraints, the more equations, the more variables or unknowns that you have, and the more difficult it is to solve the system of equations. Let me share my screen with you, and we'll go ahead and get started at this look at Lagrange multipliers. There's a really outstanding short video, about 12 minutes, I think, by Dr. Treffer Bazette on YouTube that explains the Lagrange multiplier method in a way that makes sense. So I encourage you to take a look at that video. You'll find the link for it here in the lecture notes. Let's now talk about solving an optimization problem. If you have an optimization problem, you have what's called the objective function. It's sometimes also called the optimization equation. This is the thing you're trying to optimize. It could be the volume, 
perhaps you're trying to minimize cost. I don't know, perhaps you're trying to maximize velocity. There are all kinds of variables with real world meaning that you might be trying to reach some optimal value, whether it's a maximum or a minimum. But in general, we're looking for the maximum or a minimum on some particular equation. However, on that equation, we have some kinds of constraints. In a sense, the absolute extrema problems that we did in section 4.7, where our domain in the real plane for R2, the XY plane, we had restrictions on the X and Y value. Maybe it was on a rectangle or it was within a circle and we were looking for the absolute maximum Z value within that circle or within that rectangle, but on the surface of the function. In a sense, this is in fact an optimization problem. You're trying to maximize the value of the function, the Z value subject to the constraint that the domain values, the X or the Y, or if you're looking in four dimensional space, the X, Y, and Z, have to come out of a particular part of the domain. When we're doing this, we're going to be thinking about the Lagrange multiplier method. Now, we won't work any of the examples in this section that are exactly like the ones in section 4.7. After all, we already have a method for those that works quite well. But you can, in fact, solve all of the problems in section 4.7 with the method of Lagrange multipliers. You simply let the function, the surface itself, or the function of four different independent variables be the optimization equation the thing you're trying to optimize or the objective function. And then you take the restrictions on the domain as your constraint equations. Then you'll be able to use the method of Lagrange multipliers to find the absolute maximum and minimum on that particular function subject to those constraints. Now, what we're looking for in this case is a method that is relatively straightforward as far as the theory goes. The process is relatively straightforward. We have to solve a system of equations and find all of the unknown values. We're looking for, in the case of three dimensions, an ordered triple where the function reaches a maximum or a minimum subject to some constraining equations. If it's a function of three variables, so we're in four-dimensional space, then we're actually looking at an ordered quadruple where it likewise reaches some maximum or minimum value subject to some constraints on the domain, where the domain is three-dimensional space. So it's applying to some kind of surface in three-dimensional space. The process is straightforward, but the actual execution of solving this system of equations can be quite challenging. Now, there are some of these equations that be, can be solved with matrices. If you've had linear algebra or you're taking it now, this will come in handy during this section. If you haven't had linear algebra in our last example, we will cover a little bit of how to solve some of the Lagrange multiplier methods, but it will only apply to a subset of all the problems that can be solved with a Lagrange multiplier method. Let's think about what this happens or why it happens. Now the Lagrange multiplier method really only works because the gradient itself is a vector. And if two vectors are parallel, either they point the same way or they point in opposite directions, then one has to be a scalar multiple of the other. So if you take one vector ABC and you have another one that you know is parallel to it, then it has to be some multiple, I don't know, let's say K times ABC. They have to be multiples of one another.
the extreme of values that we're looking for are going to be when the constraint curves just barely touches a level curve. Let's take a look at an image and talk about why this might happen. In the surface that you see here in this dark purple color, we have a surface graft and it's sort of, well, it looks like a hyperbolic paraboloid to me, it's saddle shaped. But I want to find the maximum Z value, not on the entire surface over its whole domain, but only the maximum Z value where the domain values are also sitting on this circle of radius one in the XY plane. So in a sense, I'm gonna take this subset of the domain, this circle in the XY plane, and I'm gonna lift it up until it intersects with the surface. Now this means because the surface is not flat, that in some places it's gonna go a little higher and in some places it's gonna go a little lower. But I'm gonna try to morph this circle directly up to the corresponding XY coordinates that lie on the surface and also lie on this circle, the constraint. I don't know if you can see it. Let me go ahead and highlight this in yellow. But if you're looking at the image there, what we want is we want to find, well, that's not showing up super well. Maybe if I highlight it in white, it will show up a little better. Yeah, that's definitely better. So if I highlight this in white, this is the projection of my circular restriction on the domain projected onto my surface. It's not the greatest graph, but you got the picture. It looks kind of like, I don't know, like a warped kind of ring, right? So what I'm looking for when I look at this on the surface is I'm looking for the maximum Z value that's on both the surface and the intersection of the restricted domain with the surface. In other words, I'm looking for the highest Z value in the white space. If I'm looking for a minimum, I'm looking for the minimum Z value in the white space. Now, why would this be where the level curve barely touches the constraint? Well, let's think about it. If we have level curves that are coming around our surface and it intersects it at two places, then there must be points in between those two places where the function is either higher and lower than at that point. The only time that the function achieves an absolute maximum value but is still on the white curve is when you lift the level curve to just barely touch the surface. In other words, where the level curve is tangent to the constraint curve projected onto the surface itself. That will give us a maximum and a minimum. Let's take a look at a second view. This is a view of the same curve, but with level curves graphed. The constraint equation, x squared plus y squared equals one, circle of radius one, is graphed here in the center in blue. Again, imagine that you are lifting this circle until it conforms to the shape of the surface. And then you're gonna look along that deformed circle and find the highest Z value and the lowest Z value. That means you want your level curve to be as high as you can possibly get it, but still barely touch the constraint. We're looking for the places where the constraint curve is tangent to the level curve. If I were to plot those points now in black, I have one here, one here, one here, and one where the blue dot was. I'm looking for those places where the Z value must 
either have been as high as it could possibly be and yet still be on the blue constraint circle or as low as it could possibly be and still be on the blue constraint circle. So we're looking for places where the level curve is tangent to the constraint curve. But if they're tangent, don't they both have a gradient vector? And if they both have a gradient vector, the gradient vector has to be perpendicular or orthogonal or normal to the tangent line. But if they're tangent at that point, they have the same tangent line. So at each of these points where the constraint curve is tangent to the level curve, they have the same tangent line, which means that their gradient vectors, which may not be the same length, nevertheless have to point in the same direction. They're parallel. If they're parallel, they must be multiples of one another so that the gradient of the actual function f as a function of x and y in this case, and the circle g also as a function of x and y, both of those have gradients that are multiples. So the gradient of f has to equal k times the gradient of g. In other words, del f equals k del g. Let's take a look at the overview now of the Lagrange multiplier method. We're going to start with a case where we have a function of three independent variables, but this can also be adjusted to be a function of two independent variables. We don't have to work in four-dimensional space. We can just as easily work in three-dimensional. Of course, we could also work in five-dimensional, but I'm not sure any of us want to do that today. So let's start with a function of three independent variables, x, y, and z. And we would like to optimize the value of f, either a maximum or a minimum. Now, the problem will have to indicate whether you want a maximum or a minimum. It can't just say optimize. Well, I suppose it could. Then you'd have to get both. But that would be more complicated. Then we're going to let g, also a function of the same three independent variables, equal to k be some kind of constraint on the function f. In the last example we saw, the constraint was it had to be on that circle of radius 1. x squared plus y squared equals 1. So in that case, k would have been 1. Now, most of the time when we're using the Lagrange multiplier method, we prefer to have the constraint equation equal to zero. It just makes it easier to find the gradient. When we do that, we simply move the one to the other side by subtracting it. So we would call our function g of x and y as x squared plus y squared minus one, which we would then set equal to zero as our constraint. When we're looking at that, that gives us two equations here. It tells us that the gradient with respect to f has to be equal to a multiple of the gradient of g. This character you see in front of del g is called lambda. In this case, it just represents a constant. We don't know what the constant is, and we may or may not need to find it. But lambda is just some constant value. Maybe del of f is 2 times lambda g, so lambda is 2. It's a constant. It does not depend on any independent variable. And then we have our constraint equation, which again, we typically move the k to the left so that we can set the constraint to be equal to 0. What this does is provide us multiple equations because the only way that two vectors, since del of f and del of g are vectors, the only way they can be equal is if their corresponding components are equal. And each of these has three components, the partial derivatives with respect to x, then y, then z. And that means that the partial 
of f with respect to x has to be equal lambda times the partial of g with respect to x. And the partial of f with respect to y has to equal lambda times the partial of g with respect to y. Since we have three components in our gradient, that actually gives us three equations. And the constraint equation gives us a fourth. And we have four unknown values, x, y, z, and lambda. The only ones we absolutely have to find are x, y, and z. We are looking for points on the constraint equation that cause the function value to be a maximum or a minimum. Let's take a look now at what it would look like for a function of two variables. In this case, the gradients have two components, so that would give you two equations, and the constraint equation would give you a third. Then you have three unknown variables, x, y, and lambda. Finding lambda may help you to find x and y, but it may also not be necessary to find lambda. It depends upon the problem. Let's define this Lagrange multiplier. And Lagrange, of course, was a French mathematician who came up with this method, or at least he's the latest one who wrote about it, which is probably more accurate. In this case, we have called this constant that represents the multiple between the gradients of the function and the constraint equation. We've called that constant lambda the Lagrange multiplier because, well, the constant multiplies and makes the two gradients equivalent. If we move all the terms to one side in the constraint equation, Again, we can get k to be zero, which is our preferred way of writing the constraint equation. Let's take a look at a Lagrange multiplier with one constraint equation. Suppose we have two functions, f and g, of two independent variables, let's say x and y, and they have continuous partial derivatives at every point of some open set coming out of the domain containing the curve where g of x and y equals zero. That's our constraint equation. So we need continuous partial derivatives. We saw that we needed these when we did the maxima and minima problems, and this is essentially the same thing, but finding maxima and minima restricted to a very specific part of the domain. Suppose that the function, when it's restricted to only those points that are also on the curve coming from the domain, has a local extremum value at the point x naught y naught, and that del of g at that point is not the zero vector. We don't want the two gradients to be the zero vector. Everything is a multiple of zero. So the lambda would not be unique. We're looking for a unique lambda value. So we omit the possibility that the gradient of the constraint equation could be the zero vector. This will force the gradient of the objective function to also not be the zero vector in order for them to be multiples of one another. Then that number lambda is called the Lagrange multiplier, and we write del of f at that point, x naught y naught, is equal to lambda del of g at x naught y naught. What we're doing, if you look up here on our original picture, and let's suppose that we take the gradient with respect to x or rather of f, right, with respect to x and y in this case. So the partial with respect to x, comma, the partial with respect to y. And that's the gradient of f. It is normal to the level curve at that point. And we know gradient vectors are always normal to level curves. However, it's also barely touching the constraint equation. 
So we must have another one that is a multiple of this, which is also going to be a gradient vector, but this time of g. They're probably not the same length, but they point in the same direction. To get from one to the other, multiply by the Lagrange multiplier, lambda. Let's take a look at what that implies about the equations. Because del of f is given to be the first partial derivatives with respect to each of the independent variables one at a time in turn, and it has to be equal to del of g, the gradient of g, which is the first partial derivatives of g with respect to the same independent variables, then we can write that the first partial of f with respect to x is lambda times the first partial of g with respect to x. And the partial of f with respect to y is lambda times the first partial of g with respect to y. In other words, we have equivalency of the component parts of the gradients. And we also have our constraint equation. If we have three independent variables, it just expands it one more set so that the partial derivative of the function with respect to z is equal to lambda times the partial derivative of the constraint with respect to z. In this case, our constraint equation would be a function of x, y, and z since we would be in four-dimensional space. Again, we want to go over why the Lagrange multiplier method works. So let's take a look at this example where the function is 8x squared minus 2y. 8x squared minus 2y produces the level curves that you see here graphed in gray and red. The blue circle is a constraint applied to this problem of x squared plus y squared equal 1. This is what it looks like on the contour plot of this function and the constraint equation at the same time. The level curves correspond to a particular value of z. We're trying to find the exact level curve that is tangent to the constraint curve, but where the constraint curve at that point only intersects it one time, not twice, and not, not at all, because there are definitely some con level curves up here that don't intersect with my constraint at all. Since the level curves up here don't touch my constraint, they can't possibly be the maximum values or minimum values I'm looking for. However, these two gray level curves, the one where the z value is negative one and the z value is zero, do intersect my constraint circle, the blue curve, but they intersect it at two points which must mean that there's a point in between where the z value is higher or lower. It's not a maximum or a minimum. That can't be the one we're looking for. The one we're looking for is the one that's highlighted red when the level curve is negative two. Let's go ahead and look now, and by the way, that occurs um, the maximum value is 8.125 or 8 and 1 8. And it occurs at these values coming from the domain. Those are the domain values where that occurs. Let's now take a look at what this looks like on the graph. So again, what we're looking for is the constraint curve, which is here plotted in blue. And we're looking for a point where it barely touches. In this case, we're looking for an absolute minimum, which is down here, barely touching the level curve where z equals negative 2. That's the point we're looking for. Solutions to the system have to be on both the surface and on the level or the constraint equation coming from the domain. Let's take a close-up look at a similar situation where we're looking at the value of z, 
you'll see here that we have the level curve for eight and one eight. And you can tell that it is intersecting our constraint circle, x squared plus y squared minus one equals zero in two places where the red arrows are pointing. At these locations, it is tangent to the curve. These are not right there on the origin. They're ever so slightly off. Notice that we have other level curves that cross, but these can't be higher than the level curve next to it where it's barely tangent, barely touching. Those are the locations we're trying to find where they share a tangent line, which forces their gradients to be multiples of one another. That does not work at a place where it crosses twice because the gradient vector at that point does not necessarily point normal to the tangent line. It only happens where the constraint equation and the function, the surface level curve, are tangent to one another. The method will only find those locations. Let's now take a look at the steps for solving it. The steps for solving the Lagrange multiplier method basically involve determining what equation you're trying to optimize. What is your objective function? What are your constraints on that objective function? If you're talking about surface area or volume of a shape, then your dimensions should not be anything but positive numbers or you don't have a real shape of that type. If you're looking for a box, your length, width, and height have to be positive or you don't actually have a box. First thing you must determine is what that objective function is and what the constraints are it are. Second, you need to know, are you trying to maximize or minimize it? Because in a real world situation, we're generally not trying to do both at the same time, though you may find some homework problems that do just that. Then we wanna set up a system of equations based on the fact that their gradient vectors are multiples. We break the gradient vector into the component parts and set each one equal to the other. In a function of two variables, that will give us two equations. And in a function of three independent variables, it will give us three equations. We could have one or more constraint equations, but we're gonna start with one. It is more typical to go ahead and subtract any constant to be rolled into the value of the constraint equation and have it equal to zero. Then we solve the system of equation using well algebra. And when we get an X naught, Y naught, Z naught value, or maybe two or three values, then we're going to check the function at those particular points. And if we're looking for a maximum, we're gonna take the greatest. And if we're looking for a minimum, we're gonna take the smallest. If we only get one point, we won't know whether it's a maximum or minimum. There's nothing about the method that identifies it as one or the other. If you only get one point, you'll have to take another point at random on the function that's also on the constraint and test it. See if it is larger or smaller than the value that came out of the Lagrange multiplier solution. Let's take a look at an example. This is the best way to learn the Lagrange multiplier method is simply to look at an example. We'll work through example one together and then example two, you'll be given an opportunity to work on it on your own. Our example is to find the dimensions of the box, so a rectangular parallelopiped, a box, with the largest volume, largest volume, well then we're trying to optimize volume, so volume will be my objective function or optimization equation. If the total surface area is 80 square centimeters, 
I can find any box I want as long as the surface area is 80 square centimeters. That surface area being 80 square centimeters is a constraint, a restriction I'm putting on the dimensions of the box. So it becomes our G function, the constraint equation. We're gonna let the dimensions of the box, the length, width, and height be X, Y, and Z. And to make it easier to solve, we're gonna place the entire box in octant one so that our X value, Y value, and Z value are always going to be non-negative. We'll put the corner of the box at the origin and extend the box into octant one. Our optimization equation based on that is simply that the X value times Y value times Z value gives me the volume of the box, length times width times height. By setting the origin as the corner of the box and extending the box out into octant one, I forced X to be one dimension, Y to be another, and Z to be the height. My optimization equation or objective function is V equals X, Y, Z. That is a function of three independent variables. We want to find the constraint equation or equations that are involved. Well, the first thing is if X, Y, or Z is not strictly positive, I don't have a box. They can't be negative, they're links. If they're zero, it's a collapsed box, which isn't a box, it's a plane. So we've got to have X, Y, and Z be strictly positive. That's actually sort of, well, three constraints, X greater than zero, Y greater than zero, Z greater than zero. We have another constraint equation that the surface area has to be 80 square centimeters. Based on my definition for the box with, well, let's say length X, width y and height z, the surface area would be 2xy plus 2xz plus 2yz, which will give me 80. Because the front and the back and the left and the right, and the top and the bottom are all going to be of the same size. I don't know that the box is a cube. I can't assume that. If I divide every term by 2, this gives me a simplified constraint equation of xy plus xz plus yz equal to 40. You always want to simplify where you can. Then we can set g of xyz to be xy plus xz plus yz minus 40 so that our constraint will be that g is equal to zero. This is just our habit or our convention. It does make it a little bit easier to go from one textbook to another. Let's set up the system of equations. What we're going to have for the system of equations is that del of f has to be a multiple of del of g. That means that del f equals lambda del g. In that case, we have equivalency of the component parts. The partial with respect to x is lambda times the partial with respect to x of g. The partial of the function with respect to y is lambda of the constraint equation with respect to y, and so forth. Let's go ahead now and write down what that means. Let's look back at our equations. Our equation for the volume was x, y, z. So the partial with respect to x is yz, which you see here. Our constraint equation, so this is our f, our constraint equation was, I think, xy plus xz plus yz minus 40 equal to zero. If I take this one, then I take the partial with respect to x, I get y plus z multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier, that constant, lambda. Then I take the partial with respect to y of the function f, the volume, which gives me xz 
and I take the partial with respect to y of the constraint, which is going to give me x plus z, also multiplied by the Lagrange multiplier. Do the same for the partial with respect to z. This gives me three equations, but I have four unknowns, x, y, z, and lambda. I have another equation, which is the constraint equation itself, g. I also have additional constraints that x, y, and z need to be strictly positive, but these are overkill. In algebra, if you want to solve a system of equations, for every unknown, you need a different distinct equation. So if I have four unknowns, I need four distinct equations to solve. If I have five unknowns, I need five equations. Three unknowns, I need three equations. If I have eight equations, but five unknowns, it's overkill. Three of those equations are not necessary to solve the system. In this case, the inequalities are not necessary, maybe, to solve the system. Let's go ahead and take a look at solving it. Solving a system of equations can be quite difficult. This is algebra after all, which is really a difficult subject. So one of the things we wanna do is figure out how to solve it. Now, this system of equations is not linear. What do we mean by linear? If the x, the y, and the z always have power one, and are never multiplied or divided or composed one with the other, then it's linear. In other words, you can have something times x plus something times y plus something times z plus a constant. But you can't have an x squared or an xy or an x divided by z or anything like that. In our case, these are not linear because we have x times y, x times z, y times z, and all the rest coming on down, all right? Um, some of these look a little off. Let me check real fast. All right, everything's fine. It is, in fact, what I wanted. In order to solve it, here's just one method. Is this the only way? No, there are other ways you could solve it as well. I went ahead and labeled the four equations that I have in terms of x, y, and z. So I have an equation four, five, six, and seven. I took these from the equations we had up above by multiplying one by x on both sides, two by y on both sides, and the third one by z on both sides. What I was doing was I was taking the original equations that you see here, and I called them one, two, and three, but I wanted their left sides to be equivalent so I could set them equal to each other. Right now, none of the three are equivalent. But if I multiply the first one on both sides by x and the second on both sides by y and the third on both sides by z, then they all have x, y, z on the left. Am I allowed to do this? Yes, I am. The fact that I know they're not zero prevents both sides of the equation from coming out to be zero equals zero. Now that I have new equations, four, five, six, and seven, I decided to pick two at random and set them equal to each other. I chose five and six. Since both five and six are equal to x, y, z, then lambda x times y plus z must be lambda y times x plus z. Then I multiplied out both sides. You must not ever, 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 ever divide by one of your unknowns. Do not divide by lambda, do not divide by x, do not divide by y, do not divide by z, unless you know for a fact they can't be zero. We know that x, y, and z can't be zero, but we don't know that lambda can't. And we're actually going to prove, in a sense, that x, y, and z can't be zero. If you go ahead and multiply out the left side and the right side, you do have a like term on the left and the right, lambda times xy. 
when you subtract that term, subtracting and adding is always okay, multiplying and dividing is not. In this case, when we subtract that term, we get lambda xz equals lambda yz. Now, we can't divide by lambda because we don't know that lambda is not zero, and thou shalt not divide by zero. So we have two possibilities. What we're doing here is we're actually moving both of these terms to the same side of the equation, so we have zero on the other. And then we're going to factor out the lambda. In fact, if we wanted to, we could factor out the lambda and the z. In which case, it has three possible solutions. Lambda is zero, z is zero, or x equals y. We know already from the situation in which we find ourselves trying to create a box with a finite surface area of 80 square centimeters that we have to actually have a box, which means that z can't be zero. What would it mean if lambda were zero? One possibility, if lambda was zero, then from the very first equation that we had, which was yz equals lambda times y plus z, if lambda is zero, then that means either y or z has to be zero. But we know that y and z can't be zero, which means that lambda can't be zero either. And this is a coming from equation one. Since y can't be zero and z can't be zero, lambda can't be zero. So lambda can't be zero, that means that the only other option has to be the one we're looking for, that x is equal to y. That gives us one relationship, but we have four unknowns, so we need another relationship. Now I need to choose some more equations, either six and seven or five and seven. Take one of the ones you've already used and one of the ones you haven't used and try those again doing the same thing by equating their x, y, z sides together, we get lambda times y multiplied by the quantity x plus z equals lambda z multiplied by x plus y. Again, we must not divide by any of the variables unless we know for 100% certain that they cannot be zero. Dividing by the variable automatically eliminates the possibility that that variable could be zero from the solutions. We go ahead and multiply out using the distributive property on the left and the right. We get lambda xy plus lambda yz equals lambda xz plus lambda yz. That makes lambda yz a common term on both sides of the equation, so we subtract and cancel it out. Subtracting does not eliminate a solution, but dividing by a variable can. In this case, we get lambda xy equals lambda xz. We move the term to the other side, and this gives us that lambda xy minus lambda xz equals zero. And when we separate our factors, we get lambda times x times y minus z equals zero. But if lambda is zero, we saw previously from equation one that that means either y or z has to be zero. Well, that means that we don't have a box. So again, lambda cannot be zero. X can't be zero. We wouldn't have any length to our box. That must mean that y has to equal z. So now we know x equals y and y equals z in which case by the transitive property, x equals y equals z. So we know that all three, in fact, have to be equal to each other. Now that we have a relationship between x, y, and z, that they're all the same value, meaning of course that our box is in fact a cube and not rectangular, um, it is a cube. Well, it is rectangular, but a cube then 
we can substitute that into the constraint equation. So we typically use the constraint equation towards the end. I chose to let all of them be x values. So I have x squared plus x squared plus x squared minus 40 equals 0, which gives me 3x squared equals 40, or x squared equals 40 divided by 3. Then when I solve for x, I get plus or minus the square root, but x has to be strictly positive. So I ignore the negative root, and I look only at the strictly positive one, which is 2 squared to 10 divided by 3, which is about 3.65. Then I can find the optimal volume by substituting this value into my optimization equation or objective function, v equals x times y times z. So I go ahead and substitute that value into my optimization equation to get an optimal value of 48.6864-ish. It's precisely 80 square roots of 30 all divided by 9. The question is, is that the maximum or the minimum? I'm trying to, I can't remember what I was trying to do. It's been so long. What were we trying to do? Uh, largest volume means maximum. We're trying to maximize it. So how do I know it's a maximum? Well, I don't yet. I only got one possible solution from the Lagrange multiplier method but I don't know that it's a maximum or a minimum. I want to check another point that's on the constraint equation, surface area is 80 square centimeters, and check and see what the volume of that box is. If the volume of the point I found previously is bigger, then that must be the maximum. If it's smaller, it must be the minimum. Let's just Pick a value and make sure that it's on my constraint equation. Now, I can't easily pick all three at the same time and make sure that it does solve the equation. The equation was xy plus xz plus yz minus 40 equals 0. But I can pick two and determine the third. So I picked x equals 1 centimeter and y equals 1 centimeter. If x and y are both 1, then I can replace my x and my y values with 1 in that constraint equation, and I can solve it for the z value, which I find to be 39 halves. Now I want to find its volume. The volume of the ordered triple 1, 1, 39 halves turns out to be 19.5. It's on both the constraint with a surface area of 80 square centimeters and on the surface, which graphs the volume function. In this case, I get that it is less than the value I found through the Lagrange multiplier method. So the Lagrange multiplier value must represent the location where I have the maximum volume. Now, the weird thing about this example is that I never did actually find lambda. I never found it. Could I have found it? Well, yes. Once I have x, y, and z, I could have easily found lambda. But what I'm trying to find are the points on the intersection between the constraint equation and the surface. And in that case, or the function, if it's a function of three independent variables, and in that case, I don't really need the lambda. I just need the x, the y, and the z, or in the case of a function of two variables, the x and the y. Let's now take a look at example two. In example two, we want to use this method of Lagrange multipliers to find the maximum value of the function 9x squared plus 36xy minus 4y squared minus 18x minus 8y subject to the constraint, 3x plus 4y has to equal 32. So in this case, we have our function of two independent variables, f, that we are trying to maximize. We're looking for a maximum value. We have a constraint equation, 
which we are going to write as g as a function of x and y equal to 3x plus 4y minus 32, and our constraint is going to set it equal to 0, which means that our constraint equation is 3x plus 4y minus 32 equals 0. How do we come up with the other constraint equations? Well, remember that the only time that you reach a maximum value is when the level curve and the constraint curve are tangent to each other. And that means that their gradient vectors align and they have to be multiples. That means del of f has to equal lambda times del of g. And that means that the partial derivative with respect to x on the function has to equal lambda times the partial derivative on the function g with respect to x. And the partial derivative on the function with respect to y has to be lambda times the partial derivative on the constraint with respect to y. And this will give us two additional equations. The partial of the function with respect to x would be, let's see, 18x plus 36y minus 18. This has to be lambda multiplied by the partial of g with respect to x, which is, well, just 3. The partial of the function with respect to y is 36x minus 8y minus 8. And it has to be lambda times the partial of the constraint with respect to y, which is just 4. We have three unknown variables, x, y, and lambda. You're now ready to go ahead and solve the system of equations using algebra. Pause the video now to work out the rest of the problem, then turn the video back on and we'll compare our results. Let's go ahead and go through example two now. In this equation, we are given a function f asked to find the maximum value on the function where the domain values were also on the constraint equation, 3x plus 4y equal 32, which is a line in the xy plane. So in this case, our constraint equation is 3x plus 4y minus 32. And our gradient vectors must be parallel. So del f is lambda times del g. Before we paused, we found three equations in our three unknown variables, x, y, and lambda. It's our job to take these three equations and find x and y. If we find lambda, that's fine, but we're looking for x and y. The first thing I did was divide equation 1 by 3, since all of the constant coefficients are multiples of 3. I also divided all of equation 2 by 4, since again, all the coefficients were multiples of 4. Let's go ahead and look at that work now. This gives me a new equation 1 of 6x plus 12y minus 6 equal lambda, and a new equation 2 of 9x minus 2y minus 2 equal lambda. And I still have my constraint equation, 3x plus 4y minus 32 equals 0. In fact, this is what we call a linear system. What do we mean by a linear system? I have x to the first, y to the first, and lambda to the first power. None of my x, y's, or lambdas are multiplied by each other or divided by each other. They're all in the numerator to the first power. None of them are composed with each other either. When you have a constant times x, plus or minus a constant times y, plus or minus a constant times lambda, plus or minus a constant, that's a linear system. 
Linear systems can be solved with matrices using what's called row reduction or Gaussian elimination. It's also called the Gauss-Jordan method. We will learn this method in example three, where the system is much more difficult because there are more unknowns. This system has three unknowns. We can solve this one by hand. You could, however, if allowed by your instructor, use a matrix in order to solve this. Let's now go ahead and use equations one and two to eliminate the y variable. Whichever variable you choose to eliminate, you must eliminate the same one twice. You need two equations in the exact same two variables to solve. So I take equation one as is, and I multiply equation two by six. This is the addition elimination method you probably learned way back in Algebra 2. This gives me 54x minus 12y minus 12 equals 6 lambda added to equation 1, 6x plus 12y minus 6 equal to lambda. Notice that the coefficients of y have the same absolute value but opposite sign. So when I add the two equations together, the y variable term drops out and becomes zero. And I get a new equation, which I'll call four, 60x minus 18 equals seven lambda. There's no constant um, coefficient that's the same in all three, so I'll leave it the way it is. If there was a common factor, I would divide all the terms by it. Now I need to take the equation I haven't used yet. I just used equations one and two. I haven't used three. I must use equation three, but I'm gonna have to reuse one and, or two. I also have to eliminate the same variable. If you eliminate a different one, you won't get a system of equations that you can solve. You'll just go in circles. So I have to get rid of y again using equation three, and I chose to reuse equation two. I multiplied equation two by the constant two to get 18x minus four y minus four equal two lambda. I add equation three to that, three x plus four y minus 32 equals zero. Again, noting that the coefficients of y have the same absolute value and opposite sign, so when I add the two equations together, they eliminate each other. This gives me 21x minus 36 equals 2 lambda. I'll call this equation 5. The whole point is so that equation 4 and 5 are left with the same two variables, in this case, x and lambda. I could choose to solve for either one algebraically, but I'm looking for x and y. So I'm going to solve the system consisting of equation four and five, looking for x. And that means eliminate lambda. I could do addition elimination again, or I could use substitution, whichever method you find easier to solve the system. In this case, I just did addition elimination again, because I was kind of on a roll. So I multiplied equation four by a negative two to get negative 120x plus 36 equal negative 14 lambda. Then I multiplied equation five by seven and I got 147x minus 252 equal 14 lambda. The coefficients of lambda are opposites, negative 14 and 14. When I add them together, they eliminate each other, leaving behind zero. This gives me the equation 27x minus 216 equals zero. That means that 27x equals 216, or x is 216 divided by 27, which is eight. Now that I have the value of x, I could go back and find lambda, but I don't need lambda. I need y. Is there an equation for my original equations that I could use with x now known to be 8? 
to find the y value without knowing lambda. In this case, there is one. It's the constraint equation. The constraint equation was 3x plus 4y minus 32 equals 0. It was the one equation that didn't have lambda in it. I can use the constraint equation, knowing the value of x, to find the value of y. And it turns out to be 2. This gives me one ordered pair coming from the domain of the function that is also on the constraint. And it's at a point where the level curve is tangent to the constraint curve. This gives me the ordered pair 8, 2. I'm still not done because even though the Lagrange multiplier method gave me a possible solution, I'm not guaranteed that this is the maximum I'm looking for. It just says it's an optimal value, but that means it could be a minimum as well. So how do I know? Well, first I'm going to substitute the ordered pair into the function in order to find the z value at that point, which is 976. How do I know that's the maximum? That's also on the constraint. I'm gonna test another point on the constraint. Now my constraint equation is 3x plus 4y minus 32 equals zero. In this case, if I pick one of the variables, I can use the constraint equation to solve for the remaining variable. So I just pick a number at random. If you get to pick at random, well, the easiest one to pick would be zero. And zero would certainly work for either x or y. In my case, I chose to use x is zero. If x is zero, then in the constraint equation, I end up with 4y equal 32 or y is 8. The ordered pair 0, 8 is on the constraint. I haven't yet put it onto my three-dimensional surface. To do that, I substitute it into the function itself. When I substitute 0, 8 into the function, I come up with a z value of 192. 192 is smaller than 976. 976 is either a maximum or a minimum, but this value of 192 is also on the constraint and the surface. And since it's smaller than that one, that has to be a maximum. And that tells me that I found the maximum value of the function subject to the constraint of 976. And it occurs at the ordered triple 8 to 976. There is a graph here of the general region that we're going to be looking at. And this is what it looks like when you put the constraint equation out there and lift it up to touch onto the surface itself. Remember that the constraint equation was 3x plus 4y minus 32 is 0, which is this black line that you see here in the xy plane. When you stretch it up and deform that line so that it conforms to the shape of the surface, it sort of ends up looking like, well, a parabola. And then we need to find the highest z value on the surface that also is on this constraint equation. In this case, it's at the very top, which we found to be 976 occurring at the domain value 8.2. Let's take a look at it out on Calc Plot 3 d This is the surface that we're dealing with, the function f right here. The next thing that we want to do is put the constraint on it. When you put the constraint on it, you can see it right here. Again, this equation is the 3x plus 4y minus 32 equals 0 that you see here in the xy plane. And this is the point where the level curve is. Now, how can we be sure that we have the right spot? If you come over here to the original where we have the function and we're trying to find the right value, let me see if I can get it rotated the way I want to. Let's see. Okay. No, that didn't do it. 
There we go. All right, so if I'm looking at it like this, maybe rotate it a little bit so I can see a different angle on it. I can put on a constraint curve by clicking on the contour plot icon. I want to do a level curve and I want to test at 976 because that's where I suspect the maximum is. So I'm going to tell it to plot a level curve at 976. I can plot others if I want to. In this case, you might want to start at something below 976. Let's say you decided to start at 970. Make sure that 976 is one of your options. So maybe go every three and produce 11 different contours. Notice that 976 is still showing up in that list. Then we want to add a constraint curve. This is below the contour color box. If you want to click on this add a constraint curve, it will open up a menu that says no constraint, which is the default, a function y as a function of x, a circle centered at the origin, an ellipse centered at the origin, or a parametric curve. We have the equation 3x plus 4y minus 32 equals 0. We could write that as a function y um, equal to, well, let's see, what would that be? 3x minus 4y move the minus 4y. So that would give me, I believe, let's check, 3 x divided by 4 minus 8. And that would be my y value. And if I hit return on this and come back to the constraint, back to the previous menu, and click create plot, hopefully it will show what I need it to show. And what is it doing? seems to be taking a while. <laughs> we may have to wait for a while for it to pop up. So let's give it another second and see if it shows up. I figured out what I did wrong. I have my signs backwards on the constraint equation. Let's come back out, add a constraint curve, go to the function, and I believe this should be 8 minus 3x over 4. I've got my signs backwards. This is what happens when you don't write down the equation. So let's give this one a whirl and see how it does. Create plot. Well, I'm still having issues. Let's see if I can get it to show on the other one. Calcplot 3D is having a little bit of trouble with this contour plot. But if we come back to the surface, we can see the level curve right up here that is barely tangent to the curve at the appropriate point. And this is putting on just one level curve. If I go back to where I tried to add multiple level curves, you can see that they're very, very close together. And it's really difficult to sort of differentiate one from another. We would need to scroll in and move it down quite a bit in order to tell which one is the level curve that we need. There are 11 different ones here, but only one of them is barely touching that curve at the appropriate point. And there are 11 different lines there, but only one of them, which is the third one in this case, is touching at the appropriate point. I started at 970 and went by three, so the first one's 970, 973. The third one is 976. And that's the one I was after. Let's consider now a caveat about the Lagrange multiplier method and absolute extrema. When you're looking for absolute extrema, we have a bit of an issue with the Lagrange multiplier method. If you're only looking for the maximum value of the function, it will find that. However, it may not find all locations where that occurs. So it will find the maximum, but maybe not all the places where that maximum turns up if there's more than one. And the reason for this is because in 
an absolute extremist situation. We have a closed bounded region. And that means that there are restrictions on either the X value or the Y value coming from the domain or possibly both. For example, if it's on a circle of radius four, then X has to be between negative four and four and Y has to be between negative four and four, which means we ought to be checking the values at four and negative four for each of those that is on the constraint and on the surface itself. The Lagrange multiplier may not find those. It will find the absolute extremum, but it will not find necessarily all locations where it occurs. Let's talk about when we have more than one constraint. The method is essentially the same, but instead of just one function, g is a function of x and y, or g is a function of x, y, and z, we'll have two equations, g as a function of x and y, and h as a function of x and y. We could even have a g, h, and k as a function of x and y, and so forth. Now, the textbook tends to use subscripts, so it calls these lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so on. However, it's easier, quite frankly, when writing not to use subscripts, but just to use a different Greek letter to represent the different Lagrange multiplier. Each constraint equation comes with its own Lagrange multiplier. So many people will use lambda for the first constraint equation and mu, which looks like the letter U with a tail on the left side as the other Lagrange multiplier. And this will make your handwriting of the problem a little bit simpler. Remember from algebra that you have to have a distinct equation, a unique equation for each variable that you have in the system. If you have five unknowns, you need five distinct equations to solve for all five variables. You can have more than five, but that's just overkill. Let's take a look at example three and get it started. When we look at example three, we want to use the method of Lagrange multipliers, this time to find the minimum value of a function of three independent variables x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This is a function in four-dimensional space. It's subject to the constraint that 2x plus y plus 2z equals 9, and another constraint that 5x plus 5y plus 7z equals 29. In other words, each of these defines a plane in three-dimensional space. It has to be on both of those coming from the domain and also intersect this shape, whatever it is in four dimensions at the same time. Let's go ahead and write down what our optimization or objective function is and what our constraint equations are. Our objective function is the function f. Our constraint equations are going to be G and H. So this is probably some W equal to the function of X, Y, and Z. We can write our G of X, Y, and Z to be 2X plus Y plus 2Z minus 9. And when we list our equations, it will be that g is equal to zero. Our second constraint is also a function of x, y, and z, and we can write it as 5x plus 5y plus 7z equal 29. Oops, let's make it minus 29 so that it fits the pattern of the others. The next thing we're going to need is we're going to need the gradient of f g, and h in order to equate these. Let's go ahead and find the gradient of f now. We'll go ahead and write this as the vector form, and then remember that dal of f, in this case, will have to be equivalent to lambda del g plus mu del h. 
So it's the sum of the other two that is going to be parallel. In this case, the partial derivatives of the function give me 2x, comma, 2y, comma, 2z. Del of g is going to give me 2, 1, 2. And del of h is going to give me 5, 5, 7. Now, for g, I'm going to use lambda. And for h, I'm going to use mu, which again looks like a u with a long tail on the left side. Now we need to equate these according to the equation for multiple constraints that the gradient of f is this time going to be parallel to a multiple of the sum of the other two, but with different multipliers. And then we're going to solve this system of equations. Go ahead and pause the video to write out these equations, then turn it back on and we'll continue this example. In this case, the equations that we get are 2x equals 2 lambda plus 5 mu. Equation 2 becomes 2y equal lambda plus 5 mu. Equation 3 is 2z equal 2 lambda plus 7 mu. Equation 4 is 2x plus y plus 2z minus 9 equals mu. And equation 5, 5x plus 5y plus 7z minus 29 equals 0. Note that equations 4 and 5 are simply our constraint equations listed again. The first three are coming from the gradient equation. Now, we could solve this system where we have five unknown variables, x, y, z, lambda, and mu by using algebra as we did before. However, that's a very long and difficult process. And in this case, it is a linear system. I have x to the first, lambda to the first, mu to the first, y to the first, z to the first. None of them are multiplied together. None of them are divided. None of them are composed. This is a situation where we can use a matrix to solve for the solution more easily. To do that, we need to rewrite this in matrix format. Matrix format will have all the variables on the left side of the equation and any constant value, such as the negative nine and 29, moved to the right side of the equation. We'll also wanna make sure that we write them in the same format. So we'll choose x to be in column one, y to be in column two, z to be in column three, lambda to be in column four, mu to be in column five, and column six will be those constants on the opposite side of the equal sign. Let's go ahead and write that down now. Notice that when I rewrote these in their linear form, that all the terms to the far left are x terms. If I didn't have an x term, I filled it in with a zero x. The next term listed is the y term in all equations. If there's no y term, you fill it in with a zero y. Then we have all of the z's, then all of the lambdas, then all of the mu's, followed by the equal sign, followed by all the constants move to the far right. It has to be in this format in order to solve it using a matrix. What we're going to do is pull out just the coefficients without their variables. This is why it's important that all of the x's are in the same column, so that column one represents x, and column two the y values, and so forth. What we're going to be pulling out are just the numbers at the front, including the signs. Let's go ahead then and talk about what this will give us once we represent it in a matrix. 
if you've never worked with matrices, they can be quite fun. And in general, I don't expect students in this class to do them by hand. I generally allow my students in the Lagrange multiplier method to use an online matrix solver. When we convert this one right here with just the coefficients put into our matrix, it's going to look like the following. Let me go ahead and write it down now. Here's the matrix that you're gonna get when you just convert the coefficients in the correct order into a matrix. Notice that it has five columns on the left side of a vertical bar indicating that there were five independent variables. There is one column on the right side of the bar indicating the constant values. Each row represents one of our equations in our system. And now we want to solve the system. What we're gonna use is what's called an online matrix solver. Here's an example of an online matrix solver. This is called Symbol Lab. If you go out to Symbol Lab, you want to click on the linear algebra tab at the top. Once you have linear algebra selected, then you'll want to choose matrices. And from the matrix drop down menu, choose Gauss Jordan in parentheses RREF which stands for reduced row echelon form. It will look somewhat like this. Notice that in this format, it does not have the long vertical bar. The vertical bar is mostly to help you make sure you get things in the right order and to remind you that the constants must be in the far right column. Let's come back to our example and count the number of rows and columns we need. In a matrix, you give the number of rows first, then the number of columns. We need one, two, three, four, five rows and six columns. Then we can come back to Symbol Lab, scroll up and click on the one up here. This will give us an option of creating whatever size we want. If you click on this, you can select your matrix size. We said we needed a five by six. Click on five by six, and next, go ahead and enter all the values from the previous matrix one at a time into these different slots. When you're done, you can hit return or click on go. Go ahead and fill them in and then hit go. So when it's done, it will give you the solution at the bottom. Again, you can see here where it applied its formula of Gaussian reduction using the Gauss-Jordan method to reduce the rows till I have on the left side of the vertical bar, a one coming down the primary diagonal and zeros everywhere off of the primary diagonal. Then the number on the right still represents the constant column. The first row then reads that 1x plus no y's, no z's, no lambdas, and no mu's equals 2, which basically says x is 2. Row 2 says 0x's plus 1y plus no z's, no lambdas, no mu's equals 1. That says y equals 1. We also find that z is equal to 2. We also happen to get the value of lambda, which is 2, and of mu, which is 0. All we really need, however, are the first three rows, which give us the coordinates of x, y, and z as 2, 1, 2. Let's now return to our problem and figure out what the function value is there at 2, 1, 2. We now have that x is 2, y is 1, and z is 2. We also have lambda and mu, but we don't need those. Now we're going to evaluate the function at 2, 1, 2, which gives us a value of 9. 
It is an optimal value, but we don't know if it's a maximum or a minimum. Unfortunately, we only got one, so we have nothing to compare it to. We need to find another point that is on both constraint equations and yet is also on the surface. In this case, our two constraints were themselves planes. We need to know what points lie on both planes. In that case, we need to first determine that these two planes are not parallel to each other and not touching, which is unlikely because we did get a value for the Lagrange multiplier method. So let's go ahead and just verify that those two are in fact not parallel. To do that, we simply take them in their original form and pull off the coefficients of x, y, and z. Those represent the normal vectors to those planes, 2, 1, 2, and 5, 5, 7. Where's the 2, 1, 2, and 5, 5, 7 coming from? Come back up here to the original equation for the two constraints and notice that these are simply the equations for a plane. The coefficients give us the normal vector 2, 1, 2, and 5, 5, 7. Those are definitely not multiples of each other, which means that these two planes do have to intersect. When they intersect, it will be at a line. Now we need to find the line where they intersect. To find the equation of the line where two planes intersect, we want to eliminate one of the variables and parameterize what we have. In this case, I chose to take the two equations, which was 2x plus y plus 2z minus 9 equals 0, and 5x plus 5y plus 7z minus 29 equals 0, and eliminate the y variable. I went ahead and moved the constants to the right side, though that's not necessary. All that's necessary is that you align like terms one above the other. I chose to multiply the first one, g, by negative 5 so that the coefficients of y would have the same absolute value but be opposite in sign. Negative 5 times 2x gives me negative 10x. So this becomes a negative 10x instead. Then I have minus 5y minus 10z. And on the right side, I have equals negative 45. Then I combine that with the other equation to eliminate the y variable, which I chose at random. And I got negative 5x minus 3z equals negative 16. Choose either x or z to be the parameter. It doesn't matter which one, just choose one. I chose z. That then allows me to solve this new equation for x in terms of z. Since z is the parameter, then I've got two of the three parts I need for parameterizing the line. I know that x is now 16 minus 3t divided all by 5. z is t. How do I find y? Go back to one of the original two equations. I would recommend g and solve for the y variable in terms of t. We replace z, let's see if I can get it on here all at once, with t and x with the expression 16 minus 3t, the quantity divided by 5. That gives us 9 minus 2t minus 2 times the quantity 16 minus 3t, all divided by 5. That gives us a parametric equation. We could write it as a uh, in parametric form with a t being multiplied by that. That would give us 16 minus 3t divided by 5, 9 minus 2t minus 2 times 16 minus 3t divided by 5 for the y coordinate, and t for the z coordinate. Now, we also need, of course, 
to choose some convenient value of t. We want a specific point. Well, this is a pretty complicated equation that I'm looking at. So probably I would just go ahead, oops, I don't need t out front and t on the inside. Um, I would go ahead and let, well, maybe t be zero. If t is zero, then I get 16 fifths, nine minus 32 fifths, which would give me 13 fifths and zero. That gives me an ordered triple that does meet the conditions that it's on both planes. So this gives me a point that I can then put into my four dimensional function to find out what its value is. When I substitute that value into my function, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, I get the value of 17. Compare the 17 to what we got from the value for which we found the Lagrange multiplier. That value was nine. Since nine is smaller than this other value that we found, it must represent a minimum value on the constraints that are also on this four dimensional function. That guarantees that it must be the minimum value that we were looking for. We have one last small detail to clear up before we end this video. Let's suppose that instead of an equals, one of your constraints was a less than or equal to. You will still, for the equals part, follow the Lagrange multiplier method to find possible solutions for where that function has an optimal value subject to the constraints. However, you're also going to need to find the critical points of the optimization function that fit within the inequality area and check those in the function when you check the value produced by the Lagrange multiplier method. In this sense, you're combining the methods from sections 4.7 and 4.8 together to solve it together. We've reached the end of section 4.8 on the Lagrange multiplier method, and in fact, the end of chapter four. In our next chapter, we're gonna take a look at what are called double integrals and triple integrals. We'll be looking at different things such as volume of a three-dimensional surface. I hope you'll join me for the next video in this series.